couple of months ago, I made a video about my V8 Scops League race at Phillip Island when I decided to start trying to understand the iRacing V8 supercar a bit more. Within Australia, almost everyone drives this car and very little else, so if I really wanted to begin integrating myself more within the Australian sim racing scene, I'd need to find a way to get faster in this car that has up until now always proved to be a bit of a weak point for me. Since that video came out three months ago though, we've definitely been finding our feet. As the white flag flies for our leaders, the two Mustangs up at the front of the field here. It's Albert's last chance now. Coming into round nine of the championship at Imola, we were on course for one of our strongest showings yet in this car with a tremendous pre-qualifying time that had us up all the way in sixth place in the overnight standings, well above the top 40 cutoff to make the main event. But those times count for nothing when the server opens on race day, so we'd be tasked with setting a fast qualifying time once more. Sadly though, our session got off on the wrong foot. I invalidated my first lap of the session, which was a big shame as we actually got ourselves nicely into the draft of some front runners, and then we made a bit of a silly mistake at the final corner on my second run, which left us with no time on the board with just five minutes remaining in qualifying. I opted to leave the pits a bit earlier to ensure I could squeeze in two fast laps if needed, but thankfully we hooked up an okay lap on our first attempt off the final run. The only downside was that we'd burnt up our tyres and had no time to do another lap when the track was in its absolute best condition. Despite our promise leading into this event, we'd start a disappointing 13th on the grid. This particular race was 51 laps long and required two mandatory pit stops. This requirement would make the race interesting as fuel would not be a concern, but choosing when and where to take tyres would be due to these cars' significant tyre falloff. The second we qualified down the order compared to where I felt we should have been, I'd already decided that we would go aggressive. We were ready as the five red lights came on for the race start. We got a fairly average start compared to those around us, but an incident immediately broke out before turn one, with Dylan Pereira unfortunately just misjudging the overlap to the cars around him and pit maneuvering himself into the outside wall, and very lucky not to not collect more cars in the process. Through the opening corner skirmish, we managed to get ahead of Luke Mitchinson on the run out of turn two and pass Adam Briggs who had sadly jumped the start and gotten a drive through penalty. By the end of lap one, we were already in the top ten. We settled in behind Geordie Sinney for the next couple of laps, who was abusing his rear tyres and making many little mistakes in the opening phase of the stint. Whilst he wasn't necessarily dropping away from the cars ahead at the moment, I felt this would be inevitable throughout the race with the damage he was doing to his Dunlop brother, so we soon decided we'd have to attack. Over the next couple of laps, I was forced into testing the run into turn one for Slipstream and even the odd little look up the inside for Tosa Hairpin, but I was never quite close enough to properly get the car up the inside by the corner's apex. At this point, both Sydney and Taliansic for Pursuit Sim Racing were struggling for speed and were not keeping up with the SSR duo ahead, so I'd need to get more aggressive. On lap six, I elected to go for a big dive at Tosa and it about paid off. Jordy left the space inside for me, but my tight line compromised my corner exit, forcing us to run door to door towards Piratella. Jordy almost cleared me on the run up the hill, but I just about kept a bumper there and sent it hard under brakes to maintain overlap and eventually forced Sydney into backing out, heading into Aqua Minerale. Finally, we were up to P9. Once in clean air, I set about chasing the three cars ahead that had broken away in our fighting, but I didn't quite have the lap speed in clear air that I thought I might have, so more often than not I was matching the lap times ahead of the cars I was chasing, but not closing on them despite dropping the cars behind me. So despite currently running in clean air, I decided I'd begin my aggressive strategy nice and early with a pit stop on lap 13 for fresh tyres and a small amount of fuel, just enough to cover the tyres being changed. My timing screen suggested I'd come out in clean air from this pit stop, but sadly we just missed time to this and came out behind two cars on older tyres. Fortunately though, David Coleman showed plenty of respect and let me through, and Manny Mascord also recognised the situation and led us through with minimal fuss. It was time for us to throw some fast laps down. We started setting lap times over half a second faster than the leaders and an entire second quicker than the cars we were racing before our stop. In fact, 
Most of the drivers we were racing earlier decided not to pit until four or five laps later, with some going even longer, with Andrew Gilliam, the race leader up to this point, not pitting until lap 22. Whilst this was not the plan by any means, we had accidentally inherited the race lead by the start of lap 24, and the whole field had taken their pit stops. This was obviously not how the race would pan out, as half the race was still left, and they were still seconds behind me on 10 lap fresher tyres. But regardless, it was nice to lead more laps in the series, but with the outright speed not being on my side, the tyre disadvantage, despite holding on to lead for two laps, we eventually waved the white flag down the start-finish straight and let both Andrew Gilliam and Griffin Gardner go through. Unlike Belle Isle, where we were hoping for a lucky safety car to aid us, there was no point defending for the race lead on this occasion, as we were all still having one more compulsory pit stop to take, so losing time fighting was pointless. On the exit of the Tosa hairpin, we also lifted out to gift James Scott a place, and we set about latching onto these guys just to get their draft and set our own pace a bit quicker. In fact, we held onto the draft so well that on lap 28, we even set the fastest lap of the top four despite the tyre deficit, we weren't getting massively pressured by Rayhan behind either. The tyres would slowly start struggling though, and by lap 30, I'd moved aside for a Rayhan too, but I could hardly hold onto his draft. With just 20 laps remaining in the race, it was time for our final pit stop to get one last big undercut on the field. This time, we came out of the pits in a pretty regrettable situation. Zachary Vlasbom on older tyres did not move aside, and sadly our best chance of punching in a quick lap was hampered. We finally passed and began catching the cars ahead by a crazy 1.7 seconds a lap. However, some drivers still defended hard despite the significant pace advantage and were still waiting to do their final pit stop. Of course, they're entitled to, they're not laps down, but battling against myself on newer tyres was just costing us both time and helping none of us long term. Tyler Blackburn would go hard defensive against us despite us running seconds quicker into turn 1. This was burning our race badly, so we went for a very aggressive, massive dive at Tosa and only just made the apex despite locking the inside front tyre. It was incredibly tight on the corner exit between us, and sadly, our cars intertangled and tripped over one another. The contact was exaggerated for what should have been a simple door rub, but sadly the consequence for Tyler was massive. I was given a 5 second post race penalty for this, which I'll absolutely accept as I could have left a bit more room on the corner exit to avoid this, but it's a shame when a simple door rub turns into something far more extreme. For this final stint from now on, we had to be a bit more careful to look after the tyres as this would be our longest stint of the race, and doing so on the biggest fuel load too. Some drivers, such as Brenton Hobson, reacted to our earlier stop this time. He managed to come out ahead of us by around 3 seconds thanks to him taking much more fuel at the first stop, whereas we took our long stop in the final stint. However, for this last stint sadly, we'd found ourselves in our own little bubble after everything had shaken out, running a solid P7 and managing tyres and incident points to the ends of the race. Despite getting reeled in slowly by the cars behind on fresher rubber, they were never really a genuine threat for track position, and we would find ourselves crossing the line in 7th place, which would become 9th place after the post-race penalty. Overall, I'm pretty happy with how this weekend of Scops went. This was by far our strongest showing of the year on absolute pace, with a P6 pre-qualifying time on day 2, and having a much stronger race pace than those we would typically find ourselves competing against in the series. The old generation supercars I was able to slowly figure out towards the end of their lifespan, but it only feels like now I'm coming to grips with our current generation supercar. Despite all my starts on the high level world championship and European GT series, almost nothing else on the sim can prepare you for the driving style required to drive these cars. Next time out, the series heads to Osher's Leven. I cannot wait to dig in around this track so we can hopefully continue chipping away at the gap to the front runners in the series. Thank you all so much for watching, if you did make it all the way through and enjoyed it, be sure to hit the subscribe button down below and tell me what you think of our updated Mustang livery too. I'll see you guys in the following video.